Catching a giant rocket booster mid-air is epic, but let's be honest, we're starting to get used to it. The next big thing is to catch the ship. I mean, how hard can it be? Well, my friend, that's exactly what we're about to find out today. First, you need to understand that Starship is not only structured differently than Super Heavy, the mission profile of this stage is also very different. These differences introduce a whole new set of engineering challenges when it comes to catching it. The initial phase of a flight involving a Starship catch by Mechazilla will closely resemble previous test missions. Following stage separation, the Starship will aim to achieve orbit and deploy any onboard payload, likely a Starlink simulator for the first attempt. Once in space, the engines will reignite at full power to fine-tune the trajectory, allowing Starship to complete a full orbit around Earth. Unlike earlier missions that ended with splashdowns in the ocean, this flight will guide Starship back toward the launch site. This won't be as easy as it sounds, at least for what SpaceX aimed for, Elon said at Satellite 2020 conference on March 9, 2020. Starship needs to be fully and completely reusable, and rapidly so. It's being designed to be relaunched an hour after landing, with zero nominal work. Like you could have scheduled maintenance, or you could have something like a squawk issue just like commercial aircraft. But the only thing you expect to change on a regular basis is propellant. And it's got to be fast. Now for the ship, unless you're launching due east from the equator, you've got to figure out some way to get the ship's orbital ground track to pass over the landing site. Otherwise, you're too far away, so the ship might take three orbits. Four orbits, maybe, to get back over the launch site. But I think we want to aim for a capability of three flights a day for the ship, most of which is taken up with getting the orbital ground track to come over the launch site, and then an hour for everything else. A one-hour turnaround is much more feasible with Super Heavy, since there's only about seven minutes between its launch and landing. Minimizing turnaround time, in that case, makes a lot of sense and is more achievable. In contrast, Starship must complete several orbits between launch and landing, which naturally pushes the turnaround time to at least a few hours on average. Achieving a one-hour turnaround for Starship isn't impossible but it will be significantly more challenging. Now, let's just assume this is a solved problem. What follows is the most demanding part of the mission, re-entry. Re-entering Earth's atmosphere is one of the most demanding challenges any spacecraft must endure. During this phase, Starship re-enters belly first, perpendicular to the ground, essentially free-falling through the upper atmosphere. Temperatures during re-entry can soar beyond 1500 degrees Celsius, creating a glowing sheath of plasma around the vehicle. This is clearly visible in onboard flight views. The heat shield is absolutely critical during this phase. It is designed to absorb and deflect the extreme heat, protecting the underlying structure of the ship. However, this time it will be slightly different. The captured vehicle will be equipped with catching pins to land by Mechazilla. If those pins were designed like on the Super Heavy booster, it would be unable to survive re-entry it would simply collapse and melt. To mitigate this, it has been suggested that retractable catch pins be used that can fold or slide into the ship's body, shielding them beneath the heat-resistant tiles during descent and deploying just before landing. However, this actually complicates the problem and even creates another risk. It would mean having to put more hinges on the windward side of the ship. For example, from the forward flap of the fourth flight down, the hinges are really not good for re-entry. The solution is nothing fancy. Rather than relying on complex mechanisms, the goal is merely to survive re-entry. The design can use a slightly modified version of the booster catch pins, protected with wedge or ramp-shaped heat tiles similar to the flap arrow covers. Since the bottom of the pin cannot be tiled, or otherwise it would be crushed by the landing arms, a small section of the pin must protrude beyond the tile line. By rounding this exposed tip, designers can reduce the heating impact as much as possible. Although this system will not be used in the upcoming flight, current battery enclosures on Starship employ a similar approach. Upon landing, the ship will ignite its three sea-level Raptor engines for a controlled descent. These engines will work in coordination with the vehicle's flaps to stabilize, steer, and slow the descent. Below, the Mechazilla arms will already be in position, fully extended to attempt the first catch of the ship. 
As the vehicle drifts slowly toward the arms, it will align its landing pins with the chopsticks. Once contact is made, the engines will shut off and the arms will close to gently secure the ship. Now, here's another problem. During the final one or two meters of the catch, the booster made alternating contact with the catch rails. This was intentional. Each of these brief impacts acted like an extremely precise thrust in a novel, passive reaction control system. These thrusts required no active feedback or complex mechanisms. It will be more difficult for the Starship upper stage to replicate this technique. Unlike Super Heavy, much of Starship's surface is covered in a relatively fragile layer of ceramic heat shield tiles. If Starship wants to use the same approach, it will need a method to protect those tiles during the process. On Flight 5, SpaceX removed some of the heat shields in the area that would later be captured to see if they would be affected by re-entry. And as you know, the ship looked pretty good until it softly touched down in the ocean, and the booster was captured for the first time. Recently, SpaceX modified the design of the lifting pins on the Mechazilla launch tower to accommodate the Starship Block 2. The previous design used a ball and socket joint, with the socket located on the vehicle and the pin extending from the tower arm acting as the ball. When mated, this joint allowed the ship to be lifted and rotated as needed to stack it onto the booster. In the new design, the ball and socket joint is integrated into the ship pins themselves, which are now part of the tower arms. A black ring appears to swivel around the ball at the end of the pin, and this ring now interfaces with newly designed lifting points on the sides of Starship V2. This update is likely driven by the need to withstand the extreme heating Starship experiences during atmospheric re-entry. On the ship just below the landing pins, there is a blackened area, possibly intended to trace or absorb the scraping caused by the chopstick arms sliding upward during the catch. When Pad B is active, catching the ship will be easier. The shorter arms of Launch Tower 2 help reduce the wobble currently seen during catches. If the ship's landing pins extend farther than the boosters, the combination of more precise arm movement and a slightly wider gap between the arms should help prevent the heat shield tiles from being sheared off. They still won't be able to catch the ship on the upcoming Flight 9. First, the vehicle needs to survive re-entry and make it to the water. If that mission goes well, the first catch attempt for Starship is likely to happen on Flight 10 or 11. Then, when both stages of the ship were successfully captured, they had basically achieved full reuse of the vehicle. So what come next? Elon has consistently emphasized that Starship isn't just reusable, but also rapidly reusable. That requires both the vehicle and the launch infrastructure to need minimal refurbishment between flights. For the ship itself, innovations like the redesigned forward flaps and experimental metal heat shields will play a crucial role in making that possible. On the Super Heavy Booster, the hot staging ring will eventually be integrated permanently, eliminating the need for its jettison each flight. As for the launch pad, new features such as the Flame Trench are being implemented to better protect the facility and support frequent, repeated launches. Also capturing two stages with Mechazilla as it is now is not the final and only form of reusing Starship. According to Elon, the ideal scenario is catching Starship in horizontal glide with no landing burn. Now, that is really difficult and will take many more years to do. Before that, the ship need to be able to land with landing legs. Starship Block 3 will be the operational version of Starship, capable of taking humans to other planets. To do that, SpaceX needs a ship that can land on legs. Starship, while indeed very tall, has some advantages when it comes to landing this way. First, it has a fairly wide diameter of 9 meters. Also, the center of gravity is actually quite low, thanks to the placement of the fuel tank and engine compartment in the lower half of the ship. Even with these early advantages, when it comes to actually building Starship's landing legs, there are things to keep in mind. First, designs like those from the SN15 era, while impressive in low-altitude flight tests, aren't going to be bring back. Their performance is optimized for flat surfaces, and their inherently disposable nature conflicts with the company's core commitment to full reusability. The most likely option is a landing leg design similar to Falcon 9's, which gives SpaceX an advantage due to their prior experience with the system. However, modifications will be needed to accommodate Starship's unique requirements. The new legs will be longer and larger than those on Falcon 9, with the number increased to 6. 
This redesign is essential to support Starship's mass and reduce the risk of collapse if a leg is damaged. While Starship mainly uses stainless steel, the legs will likely be made from honeycomb carbon fiber, similar to Falcon 9, to save weight. Although still relatively heavy, they would be much lighter than stainless steel alternatives. SpaceX's landing on legs mission huh, might be closer than you think. Artemis 3, the mission that aims to return humans to the lunar surface, is rapidly approaching, at least according to NASA's current schedule. As part of that mission, SpaceX will provide its Starship Human Landing System, HLS, a specialized version of Starship designed for lunar landings. Unlike the standard Starship spacecraft, the Starship Human Landing System does not re-enter Earth's atmosphere, allowing for the removal of the spacecraft's atmospheric heat shield and flight control surfaces. This reduction in mass enables fewer Starship tanker launches for refueling once in orbit. Like other Starship variants, the HLS version is equipped with six Raptor engines, which are used during launch and the majority of the landing and descent phases. As the HLS approaches within 100 meters of the moon's surface, it will rely on high-thrust landing engines located in its midsection. These are designed to minimize the risk of plume impingement on the lunar regolith, which is a critical consideration for a safe and stable landing. Interestingly, these engines use gaseous oxygen and methane rather than the liquid versions used by the main Raptor engines. NASA has emphasized that minimizing changes in vehicle configuration and making the design of Starship HLS as consistent as possible will benefit future builds. This approach eliminates the need for additional testing, evaluation, and verification of different designs, allowing SpaceX to accelerate production and ensure timely delivery for mission integration. Power for the spacecraft comes from a ring of solar panels wrapped around its body. In the final descent phase, Starship's landing legs will deploy, allowing for a soft touchdown on the moon. SpaceX will need to bring Starship fully online quickly and then focus on achieving a successful landing on its legs. At the same time, they'll also have to solve the challenge of orbital refueling. A decade ago, many believed that landing a Falcon 9 booster was pure fantasy. Just over a year ago, people said catching a booster mid-air was equally unrealistic. Yet time and again, SpaceX has proven the skeptics wrong by turning these ideas into reality. While there are still some challenges with Starship itself, I have no doubt they'll eventually master both stages and achieve full reusability. SpaceX has made the impossible happen more than once. Adding one more to the list doesn't seem that far out of reach. If you found this video useful, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. We're steadily approaching our 5,000 subscriber milestone, and your support truly helps us grow and improve the content we bring you. Thank you for watching.